Well, today I am joined by a true digital marketing OG. My friend Jay Bear is a marketing and customer experience author, advisor, and researcher. He's a Hall of Fame speaker and the founder of Convince and Convert, where I was fortunate enough to work alongside and be mentored by him for the past eight years. He's my friend and he's soon to be yours. Jay, thank you for joining me on the brand new Brand to Fan show. LT, fired up to be here. Congratulations on the show. Always great to spend some time with you. I know this is going to be a tremendous hit, this episode notwithstanding. Oh, this episode might be the, you know, <laughs> might set the bar for the rest. I'm just going to end the show. It's going to be a one and one and done. Uh, no, actually, uh, thanks to you and and you know several of the people that we're going to have on this show. Good. Um, we you know have interviews lined up with people like Brian Fanzo, with Jake McKee, with Tim Hayden, nice. um, with Mary Nice, who we worked with. Um, so many great people across marketing, across business, and um, I couldn't uh, stair step into kind of the next thing without kind of asking for your permission. You're a little bit kind of like the godfather, not just of digital marketing, but of you know, my career over the last 10 years. So uh, with your blessing, let's kick this off. Blessing provided. All right. Well, speaking of the last 10 years, which is about as long as we've known each other, Mm -hmm. um, I think I met you right after you wrote or were publishing Utility. And that is, of course, one of one of the best selling books that you've written. Um, Mm -hmm. Not to make you feel old, but I think it turns 10 this year. And it really became Facebook told me that because I'm, I'm terrible at knowing when my books were published. You're like, when is that published? I'm like, I don't know. Ask Amazon. But no, uh, Facebook, Facebook served up my New York Times uh, bestseller list post to me recently. Uh, the same week that I got a reminder of a post I made about here's a new toiletry kit. So both my toiletry kit and, and utility are approximately 10 years old. And both of them probably found in the webs of Google somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. In utility, it really became a, a baseline of everything that we did at Convince and Convert, which I think is part of the reason why I wanted to come work with you and um, and kind of learn more about this piece. You made the case there for businesses creating content that helps rather than sells. Mm-hmm. Has your definition of utility changed or have you thought differently about how brands need to show up as useful? Has that changed over the past decade? I mean, if anything, I think we're at a point now where it's more true and more vital than ever. There, there was a, a point in time when organic sort of promotional social media reach was cheap and easy, right? Before Facebook did the, the algorithm change, before Instagram did the algorithm change, before LinkedIn sort of made some of their changes as well, where I was like, man, I don't know, maybe I was wrong. Like maybe, maybe you can just tell people buy my stuff ad infinitum and that will actually work. But of course, as we know, um, the pendulum has swung the other way. And so today, especially with AI and and other technologies uh, bursting upon the scene, the creation of content in any form is not only not a barrier to entry, it's in some cases a hindrance. I mean, there's so much of it uh, in any format that, that the fact that it exists is not a winning hand. It has to be something that benefits the consumer that creates that sort of idea of radical relevance. And so I would argue that today, even now, in the microcosm of a potentially down economy, if you're going to spend the time to make anything, make sure you're making something that people actually benefit from that isn't just a commercial. Yeah. Do you see that utility, like, have you seen any examples of where people are taking utility principles and then applying them to not just the content they create, but just how they show up for their customers? Absolutely. I mean, I I feel like there's a lot of newer businesses and and, and newer, I would say within the next uh, last 10 years um, that weren't necessarily you know, spurred on by the book, but just the overall trend that really are the whole business model is is just about being more helpful or more useful. You think about a company uh, comes to mind like Chewy.com, right? I mean, mm-hmm. selling pet supplies on the internet was tried many times in the past. Like I've been in digital marketing since 93. So I've seen all the failures of pets.com and the original petsmart.com and that entire milieu all went up in flames. Uh, and then they said, well, what if we do the same thing but we just put all the customers first and, and we and we say, well, how are we going to, um, you know, outflank your local pet giant company? And it's like, well, we'll just be nicer. We'll just be more empathetic, more helpful, more useful. Uh, and, and so you can you can build an entire business model around solving customer problems. And that's always been true. 
But I think it's easier with a cold start because you're not burdened by all the legacy processes and maybe cross purposes that that uh, a lot of older companies have to deal with. Yeah. I mean, my new thesis, and it's the backbone of this show specifically, is that marketing does two things. And as you know, I, I actually came from the PR comms world and then learned pretty much everything I know from marketing from the fabulous folks at Convince and Convert. Um, but it, it for me, it boils down to two things. You get someone's attention and then you help them fall in love with you or your brand, your product and your service. I know, you know, a lot of marketers who think that attention is just sufficient, but also you and I know that turning customers into fans takes a lot more effort or it takes kind of that embodiment of someone's brand values like Chewy to really make that pay off. So and usually, and usually more time too, right? I mean, th this idea that somebody's going to have an initial potentially cursory interaction with your brand and your company and instantly become a fan, right. like it's possible for sure. But the, the obstacle to clear, to make that happen psychologically is really, really high. Right. The customer experience ha has to be so dynamic and so outside the realm of customer expectation that they're like, wow, I can't believe that's true. I'm in it to win it. These guys are my ride or die after one touch point. That doesn't happen very often. It's not impossible. Don't get me wrong. But but typically the creation of a fan relationship requires multiple bites of the apple. Yeah, absolutely. I, I kind of think of it as throwing a rock into the pond. Right. So that's that first, maybe there's one splash, but it's kind of everything else that happens from there that ripples out that feels like that becomes the the experience that allows yep. for fandom. And when you have multiple rocks being thrown, they're not or pebbles being thrown, then all of those kind of those rings start to intersect. And ironically, this isn't really a marketing issue. It's really more of an operational issue. Sometimes fandom is created and intensity of affinity is deepened when things don't go well. I wrote about this in, in the Hug Your Haters book, this idea that one of the best ways to create a deeper relationship with customers is for something to go wrong and you fix it. Yeah. Right? So this this is where Southwest has really has really dropped the ball, I think, in the last few weeks as, as we're having this conversation. Like they had an opportunity to use this meltdown as propellant for for customer engagement for fandom and they're a brand that has a lot of fans innately but this like well we're really sorry everybody gets a bunch of frequent flyer points i like i just feel like they could have done a much better job turning uh, lemons into lemonade i think that's interesting i think if you talk to someone who is already a fan of southwest they're already loyal in some way to them having the extra points might be the thing that that makes it okay awesome. but i think also from the outside looking in that doesn't, I don't really fly Southwest that much. That doesn't do it for me. So I think you're right. I think that having kind of that, being able to respond and, and it is operations. None of this is just marketing. It really just starts from, it goes through the business. They just put a finer point on it real quick for the, for the uh, audience. The data show that customers who have a problem that your brand fixes are literally more loyal and have a greater lifetime value than customers that never had a problem at all, which in my very Machiavellian mind makes me think, what problem can I engineer <laughs> that I know that I can solve to trigger this psychological shift? Um, but maybe that's uh, you know a little too heavy handed, I don't know. Well, you did co-author the definitive manual for word of mouth marketing uh, in your book, Talk Triggers. And in that book, you and Daniel Lemon delivered this strategic framework for generating word of mouth. Now you didn't go all the way to Let's engineer a problem so that we can fix it. But why is having a plan for word of mouth important for brands who are trying to build fans out of followers or audiences? Because it rarely happens on accident. Right? We, we think it does. This is one of the big business mysteries of the last century. This idea that we've all kind of collectively lied to ourselves and said, well, here's the deal. If we just run a good organization and we kind of stick to our knitting and we don't blow it, then people will naturally talk about us to their friends. Mm -hmm. That's not actually true though. This is why you never see a three-star review, not very often, because why would you take the time to write it? Yep, I went to this business and got pretty much what I thought I was gonna get, three stars, right? We, we tell stories to one another, which what is word of mouth? It's a story. We tell stories to, to one another, whether it's face-to-face -face or in a Google review, and a Google review is just word of mouth with shelf life. 
we only tell stories when something happens we don't expect because otherwise there is no story. So we only tell stories when things happen that we didn't expect that were great or things happen that we didn't expect that were terrible. And consequently, you have to actually create some sort of operational hook in your business that is engineered to create those stories because it's something that the customers didn't expect or anticipate to happen. So it's very rare that businesses can create sustained word of mouth on accident. It's always an operational twist. And what's fascinating about that, Lauren, is that literally in every case that I can think of, and I've spent a lot of time on this issue, the twist, the story that people talk about isn't the core product or service being delivered. So sure. one of the case studies in the book is a cheesecake factory. Anybody who's ever been to a cheesecake factory knows what their talk trigger is. They know what the story is that people tell about cheesecake factory. It's not about cheesecake. It's not even about the food or the decor, which is in and of itself bizarre. It's the fact that the menu is the size of a phone book. And you can just go to Twitter right now and search cheesecake factory plus menu. And you'll waste a whole day just looking at memes and poems and videos and sonnets all about the size of the menu. Now the menu is, they're not in the menu business, right? They're in the makings of foods business. But people don't talk about that. They talk about the talk trigger, right? And it's not an accident. Yeah, I think that's, that's really cool. How does, how does someone do this affinity building when customers' expectations are changing? And I think, you know, there's a lot of talk obviously about post pandemic. And then there's certainly a lot of talk that like most of the problems that we are identifying today are actually showed up five, 10 years ago and they've just manifested yep. after 2020. But is it harder or just different for brands to cultivate affinity today with their audiences? Um, I don't, I think it's both. So customer expectations have always gone up and always shifted. Mm -hmm. right? They're never static, right? One of the things I talk about in my new uh, presentation is this idea that, you know, in the 1860s, the Butterfield Stage Company got the contract from the United States government to deliver the mail. And the SOW, right, the service level agreement uh, for the mail delivery was St. Louis to San Francisco. And they promised, this is how they got the contract. No one could compete with them. They promised that they could get a letter from St. Louis to San Francisco in 25 days. Wow. And people couldn't believe it. Like 25 days, this is some kind of a miracle. The contract is yours. Now, that was a long time ago, but not really, right? You know, it was like 140 years ago. So customer expectations never stand still. So yes, you, you all, you're never done. This idea of customer experience and creating fandom through operations is never done. It's not a project. It's a process. You have to continue to go back to the well. Now, I would say a couple of things um, to augment that. One there is some evidence to suggest that when you can truly deliver a differentiated experience to customers, it creates a lot of rich loyalty and attitudinal advantages, maybe even more so than it did in the past because customers are so manifestly disappointed with the experience that they get from so many businesses today. We expect little, you know, we're like, yeah, this is going to suck. And then when it doesn't suck, you're like, wow, this is not sucky. I love these guys, right? So there's that. Conversely, though, there's a school of thought that suggests that especially young consumers may be less brand loyal and less sort of likely to, to sort of put a flag in the ground and say, this is the brand that I'm going to be loyal to forever about anything. Mm -hmm. to me, that's more of a generational question than it is an operational question. Yeah, I, I saw some research on that as well, that the younger generations are less brand loyal. They also do more research. Right. They're looking in more places. They're looking for all those touch points because maybe you need to show up in a handful of different ways well to gain enough trust for them to transact with you in some way, shape or form. Um, but also that we know that younger audiences, but also older audiences or customers are more likely to transact and be loyal if they understand what your brand values are and how they represent. And that's something that I've been working on with clients is is really like taking them back to the start. And this is everything from like the local sandwich shop um, to speakers like yourselves is like saying like, okay, let's get in a room and say like, what does your brand actually represent? Can you Absolutely. name it? And can the people on your team name that? Because if you don't know what it is or you're vanilla, then people who can't identify that with you 
uh, identify you that th- through that, they're not going to take a chance. They're not going to give you their dollars. They're not going to give you their word of mouth. And I think that is really interesting. And, and some of the examples I use are like, well, obviously Penzi Spices. Mm-hmm. Penzi Spices, 2015, saw some writing on the wall with uh, with the upcoming political election and took a stance. Yep. And in, while taking a stance on the left side said, we're going to lose a ton of customers. So if you believe what we believe, please show up and give us, like, please think about us when you're buying your holiday gifts. Please give spices to your friends because that is, you know, like the essence of their brand is, is cooking and, and cooking is for everyone and, and cooking is an act of love. Um, so we talk about Penzi's. We also talk about Chick-fil-A and Hobby Lobby brand values yep. emanated through and through. So it can be, it doesn't have to be political, but I think that brands who don't identify and don't put that out there or aren't comfortable with that are finding that on all age, age ranges of their customers, you know, that they're not actually able to transact or convert like they, they did. Yeah. There's some incredible research on, on that from uh, Accenture that talks about how willing consumers are now to change brands if that brand doesn't fit their, their worldview um, about whatever. And one of the, the sort of substats in that report that totally blew me away was some 40 something percent. I think it was 42. Don't, don't hold me to it somewhere in that ballpark. 42% of consumers said that they would switch banks if the bank didn't believe the same things that they believe. Now, I don't know when the last time it was that you switched banks, but it is 0% fun. Like it sucks no matter what. I mean, the best, the best bank switch is terrible. Uh, and, and to say like, I'm going to go to all that trouble because my bank doesn't believe what I believe mm-hmm. that, that to me is a, a real bellwether. So I couldn't agree more. And, and it's such a huge shift from when I got into marketing, right? The idea then was maximum addressable audience. And, and even the way you bought media was like, well, we're going to buy a bunch of radio and TV and print and outdoor. And a bunch of people who see those ads will never be customers, but that's the cost of doing business. And now it's the exact opposite. It's all micro-targeting, some of it based on, uh, of course, demographics and psychographics, but also based on this idea of, of kind of concentric fan circles. Like, who are our people? Tom Webster calls it the theory of the firm. Like, w- what do we stand for? And if we stand for something and we actually stand for it, it's not just sloganeering, it's not just mm-hmm. a, you know, a, a campaign, this is really what we are all about, then go find people who also feel like that. And the chance of them being lifelong customers and true fans goes way, 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 way up. It's a thousand true fans, all those kind of things. So the challenge is, I see it on the labor side, right? So, so projecting to potential customers, this is what we're about right? We're Penzies and we believe this is one thing, but getting everybody who works at Penzies Mm -hmm. to be on that same track is really, really difficult, especially in in choppy labor markets. So it's got to start from the inside out. You can't, you can't tell customers, this is what we believe. And meanwhile, like a third of your employees aren't on board. So you gotta, you gotta figure out what it is internally, make that stick, then take it externally, which is really hard. Yeah. I think that's actually some of the root of the problems with the biggest brands that like are manifesting now. So we talked a little bit about Southwest Airlines and one of the most interesting posts, I'm sure you saw it on Facebook, was that the inside pilot who's been Mm -hmm. here for 30 years, you know, divulged that, you know, they saw a shift from the original founder to the the team that ran the brand for the last 20 years. and, And it went from core values to financial ROI and that the employees were actually signaling we're losing, we're going to lose, this isn't right. And then as a, you know, real life, authentic minivan driving mom of three, you know, we did a Disney trip this past year. Well, in the Disney forums, and when you look at the Disney groups, and even in the Reddits and, and all of that, people are complaining about cast members and interactions and how they're just not, that same magic isn't delivered consistently. When, when you took your kids to the Disney experiences, I'm sure like that was dialed in. Right. And, and so part of that is, you know, and everybody can blame like, well, lots of people lost their jobs, had to transition da, 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 during the pandemic, but like how operationally can you get someone to buy into that idea? Or aren't employees, you know, just as core of an audience group that you have to have yeah. fans. 
I, I think there's two issues there. One is, do the employees share the values of the company? But that's that's a big question, but that's the first one. The second one is operationally, and this is a problem for so many businesses, nobody has any experience mm -hmm. anymore because everybody changed jobs. Everybody left jobs, changed jobs, came back, didn't come back, whatever. Like nobody has been in their job more than like a year, like anywhere. It's crazy, right? And so, no, it's not going to be as operationally sound as it was pre-pandemic because those people had been doing it for five, six, eight, 10, 12 years. And now everybody's been doing it for 11 months. So no, it's not going to be as good. Nothing, nothing is as good because all the experience in like essentially every role in the economy just like poof, went out the window. It was like a hard reset. Um, and, and that's going to take years to get through. But, and that's why, probably unsurprisingly, uh, the ACSI, the American Customer Service Index, which measures customer satisfaction across every sector of the economy, is the lowest it's ever been, ever. So despite the billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars we spend on customer experience and customer service and operations and everything else, customers are less satisfied now than they have ever been. And it's partially because nobody has any experience anymore in their role. That's really interesting. And also, I feel just like we should maybe take a pause and everybody just like beat our heads against the wall, the wall for a minute and... Uh, do that. But, you know, it's true. Like we don't have patience, like as a customer, as a consumer, we don't really have patience for someone's operational challenges or that everybody's only been there for a year. What are you finding? I know you just did a ton of research on, um, on what customer expectations are and, and kind of how to, how to meet them. So what did you find out in your last study? Well, the reason I did this research is called the time to win. And it's the deepest dive really ever anybody's ever done on consumer patience and business responsiveness. And, and we found a really significant tie between business responsiveness and revenue to the degree that if you are faster than customers expect, you will make more money. And if you're slower than customers expect, you will make less money. Like it's as, as clear as day. Uh, the reason I did the research is that one of my observations is that coming out of the pandemic, we all kind of realized that we're not promised anything in life anymore. And, and some of us kind of learned that lesson in a harder way than others. But we sort of realized like, geez, okay, huh. We all only have 1,440 minutes a day, period. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're Elon Musk or someone experiencing homelessness. It doesn't matter if you're American or Venezuelan or a grandfather or grandson. We all have 1,440 minutes a day, period. You can't buy more. You can't make more. We all have the same. And time is truly the only inelastic resource. It is the only thing on the planet that we share equally. We don't share oxygen equally. We don't share water equally. We certainly don't share food equally, but we do share time equally. And one of the things that happened in the pandemic is we realized like, wow, time matters. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the trends that we've been talking about uh, in business, this idea of sort of great resignation and quiet quitting and leisure travel and work from home and hybrid and all of this kind of stuff is all actually just the same trend, which is that we care about our time and how we spend it more than ever. So today, even more so than before the pandemic, if you are slower as a business than your customers expect, it feels to those customers as if you are stealing time from them. Mm -hmm. And if you are faster than they expect, it feels like you are giving them a gift, a very precious gift, the gift of time. So it doesn't matter whether you're trying to get new customers or keep the customers you've already earned. If you can be faster than they expect and anticipate, good things will happen. That's really cool. And it makes total sense. You know, the 1,440 minutes a day you know, whether I spend those in my son's preschool class, you know, three hours a, in a morning to, to interact, you know, I've been guilty of like having my phone in the pocket and checking a text message or seeing if I got an email at that same time and trying to kind of micromanage the time that I'm spending because I want to be in both places. But truly, if I give a hundred percent of my time to my clients for the time that I've allotted or a hundred percent of my time to my son and his friends in that time that I've allotted, I like, I feel better as a human, right. In in doing that. I also know from working with you that like time is when I send you an email, you, I, I mean, I could stop watch you it, how fast you respond. So I know this is something that you live day to day. Is there a brand um, specifically or a person that like kind of models this for you? Well, think about, and again, we, there, there's a lot of newer companies that have been purpose-built for responsiveness from the jump. 
And that's easier for sure than saying, let's take a legacy business and get faster. Yeah. Now, I think all legacy businesses should do that uh, because, let me just touch on this for a second. If you're not the fastest in your category, you will lose customers. And here's the insidious part. It will largely be invisible to you. So recently I was with some, some friends of mine uh, and we were having a, a meeting, uh, just three or four of us in a hotel room and it was time for lunch. And somebody said, hey, let's get room service. And the guy whose room it was said, no, don't get room service. I tried to get room service yesterday and it took like 75 minutes. We don't got that kind of time. Let's just go to the restaurant across the street. Now, four grown men hadn't eaten all day, fancy hotel. That would have been a 200 and something dollar room service bill easily. The hotel got zero dollars and they have no idea that that happened. And they have no idea why they didn't get that money. Because when you are not the fastest, the evidence of that is largely invisible. I got this office painted not long ago. Got three bids as one does. First painter got back to me in four hours. Second painter got back to me in a day. Third painter got back to me in two days. Which one did I hire? The one that got back to me in four hours, who was not the least expensive. In fact, was the most expensive. Why does that matter? Well, I think most people share this philosophy now which is if it takes them a long time to get back to you before they have your money, how long will it take them to get back to you once they have your money, right? So responsiveness, we treat speed as caring now. We, we treat speed as caring. Now, painter two and painter three didn't get the business and they have no idea why. They will think, however, because this is human nature and sort of business uh, economics, they will assume that they didn't get my job because they weren't they weren't inexpensive enough. So the next time they're in a competitive bidding situation, what happens? They drop their price, but they're still slow. So they don't get hired again. Next time, what do they do? They drop their price again, but they still don't get it. And so they literally grind themselves into, they auger themselves into the earth on profit margin until they're so much less expensive that they get hired regardless of how long it takes them to respond. But now they don't make any money on the job. That's how businesses die. Right. And we don't talk about this enough. If you're not the fastest, you lose money, but you largely have no idea why, which is really, really dangerous. Hmm. That's, that's really interesting. And as I go into starting a new business and a, and a startup company where I can't necessarily deliver product to, to end customer, I have to think about how I, how I engineer that like on the exactly. site and all yep. the things. So it's all um, expectation management, right? So that's the, that's the, the key to this sort of system is, is communicating what's going to happen when and why. So I'll give you, I'll give you a sort of a juxtaposition here. If you get an Uber or a Lyft, you're looking at your phone and it says six minutes. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes that feels like it's a lie, but it still says six minutes. <laughs> And you see the little icon, right? You see the car. Now, sometimes they're like going in circles. Like, what is this bro doing? I don't understand. Is he doing donuts? Like, what? I don't understand. But at least you see the thing and it counts down. Now it's three minutes. Now it's two minutes. Now it's one minute. So you have essentially what I call a use clue. You have a use clue all the way through, right? And what that does is reduces anxiety because anxiety is no way to create a fan. Now, I'll ask you to remember, you are just old enough to remember these days, when we didn't have Uber and Lyft and you needed to get somewhere, you would call a taxi. You would call a taxi number and some gruff dispatcher, taxi, um, would, would like, yeah, they'll come and get you. So you have called somebody and allegedly a taxi is coming. That taxi will arrive somewhere between one minute and one year. That is all the information you have, somewhere between one minute and one year. You have no idea, all the taxis look alike. You have no idea which taxi is yours. They don't give you a taxi number. They all look alike. And then how long will it take you to get your, to your destination? Unknown. How expensive will this ride be? Unknown. Literally zero information, which is massively anxiety producing. So the best thing you can do, especially if you're not in control of the entire uh, delivery cycle and the time horizon, is just to make sure you over communicate every process step along the way. Because what freaks people out and what makes them not be a fan isn't necessarily the speed itself. It's speed versus expectation. That's the actual thing that matters. It's not raw speed. Yeah. Because sometimes you can be too fast. You don't want to go to the fastest tattoo artist in town. Like mm -hmm. sometimes you speed is not 
the winning hand. It's not so much raw speed, it's speed versus expectation. So as long as you can set expectations and over communicate, you'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. Noted. Writing that, writing that part down. You have given so many great examples about, you know, both research and, and companies that are doing this right. I'm curious, is there a story that maybe you don't share all the time about a brand or about an experience that you had that mm. feels like uh, needs to be shared? Oh, that's a great question. I wish I would have prepped this up a little bit more. We can uh, come. Yeah, no. So here, here's one. Um, so I had a, a surgery about 18 months ago, something like that, 19 months ago. So I went to the hospital for it. They had to knock me out in the whole thing. Uh, and it was really great because there's two things about it. One, they had a whiteboard in my room and on the whiteboard, it said like, okay, here's the, here's the nurse's name, the doctor's name, all that sort of like all the people. And then when I got there, they, they went over the whole schedule with me, right? As somebody who's pretty organized and time conscious, I really appreciated that. And it was like this idea of expectation management was really, really good because there's a lot of fear and anxiety when you go in surgery, especially if they're going to knock you out. Uh, and, and they really over delivered in terms of making sure that like, I knew exactly what was going to happen when, with whom, why, and I really appreciated that. So that was great. But then what really blew me away, Lauren, was it was like two days after the surgery, I'm at home, mail comes in the mail is a handwritten thank you note from the surgeon and all the nurses at the hospital. Thank you, Jay, for letting us take care of you. And I was like, well, wait a second. I thought I was going to maybe send you a thank you note. I didn't think I didn't think you were going to send me a thank you note for the permission to cut on me. Uh, and that really had an impact on me because um, it was certainly something I didn't expect, especially in that sector. I mean, like maybe for my private physician, but but from you know nurses and doctors at a hospital, I will literally hopefully never see again. Um, that really stood out, right? And and those kind of little unexpected kindnesses can go a long way, especially in today's society. Right. And then it generates, right. If that's an operational choice, For you're sure. like yeah, not the friend. only person they're sending the thank you note to. So, yeah. yeah. And it's creating those stories. It's creating that affinity. And like you said, I don't ever really need to go to that hospital. Or I don't want to need to go to that hospital, but if, if you have the choice of having to go to a hospital, yeah, now you know exactly. which one you're going to choose. Yeah. Yep. That's really interesting. Well, let's pivot for a minute because you did take a step beyond, you know, just a marketing guru last year. Um, and you shone the light on a different side of your personality, if that's possible, um, because you are pretty flamboyant in online anyways, right? I mean, plaid suit, not aside. Um, but can you tell me why you chose tequila as the thing that you wanted to build upon and, and kind of why you thought that you needed to do that in the first place? Yeah, I find myself as the world's number two tequila influencer, which is not something I necessarily set out to do. But um, I've been interested in, in agave spirits for about, I don't know, 25 years or so. Um, our mutual good friend, Tom Brecky, is the one who actually got me into this originally. He and I were best friends and we both lived in Phoenix. And there was a, a Mexican food restaurant in Scottsdale that he and I used to go to on boys night. And the bartender there was very, very, very early into the mezcal game. So he'd go down to Oaxaca and mule back a bunch of really rare bottles and stuff. And Tom and I would always sit at the bar and hang out. And he just sort of um, took us down the rabbit hole with him. And, and we were sort of acolytes um, at the altar. And so I'd always really interested in it. And of course, spent 40 years living in Arizona. So you got a strong Latino culture there anyway. Uh, and so over time, I got more and more interested in it and spent more and more time in Mexico and visiting producers, et cetera, uh, and just learned a lot about it. And, and when I stopped um, actively working on the Social Pros podcast on the microphone, I just said, hey, you know what I'm going to do just experimentally? Let's take the time I used to spend recording my podcast and let's instead create some tequila videos and try and educate um, folks out there who, who are not you know, experienced tequila drinkers and may want to know more about this magical spirit. And so I just started creating videos on Instagram and TikTok and, and it uh, sort of took off. And so now we are nine months later and I've got hundreds of thousands of fans and a bunch of brand sponsorship deals. And I'm working on two new tequila brands as a consultant and uh, a bunch of other things. And so it's, it's actually certainly not threatening my day job from a revenue standpoint, but, uh, but, you know, it's actually a line item in the budget now, tequila revenue and doing a lot of corporate tastings and things. And, it's been really fun because tequila has a lot of nuance to it and a lot of things that you can teach. And so many people out there are very casual tequila fans, mm -hmm. right? They'll drink a margarita here or there. They had that one time in college 
uh, right? And they don't want to repeat that, right? But but everybody knows tequila and tequila consumption in the US is going up very, very quickly anyway. So it's a good time to get on board. Uh, and my observation, the reason it's really worked for me, one, I'm not, you know, I don't have a problem creating content, but but more so there was several other people out there that make tequila content, but almost all of them were like tequila nerds making content for nerds. And there's definitely a market for that, but not a very big market. So I said, well, nobody's really making tequila content for everybody else, for the other 38 million people who are very casual fans. And so I sort of set the bar of like, no question is too too basic. No no topic is, is too... Um, uh, elementary and and basically created content at almost the 101, 202 level. And it's been really effective. Yeah. Have you seen the differentiation between, you know, you are a professional speaker, you're on the road, you're in demand. Now has the tequila part of your personal brand, like influenced who's booking you or what they're asking for? Um, kind of. So it, we don't talk about too much on the website right now, but I'm, I'm in the process of a new logo, new website, new uh, trailer, all of which will include tequila stuff. It has been a really powerful differentiator once people hear about it. Okay. So, so once you start talking to a meeting planner or a speaker's bureau and say, oh, and Jay also does tequila tastings, would you like him to do a tequila education class and tasting for your sponsors, your, your key executives, et cetera, while at the event? It's very often that they are interested in doing that. So I'm starting to, to do both. I'll come in and do a keynote and do a tasting the night before, the night after. Um, which is a nice little extra revenue uh, line item for me. It's just so novel in the in the speaking industry that somebody does this that uh, it it is it is memorable for people. So yeah, we're leaning into it a lot this year. Yeah, I mean, I can probably count on one hand the number of speakers who have bring something so unique and different to the audience or to the meeting planners themselves. Like Clint Pulver is one, right? He yeah. travels with his drum kit. That and you've got everybody in the it. audience drumming. And that's a differentiator that, you know, Gordon knows I'm not going to be playing drums anywhere, especially operationally. Not. I don't know how that guy does it. Like me traveling with a bottle of tequila is one thing. Him traveling with a full drum kit is another thing entirely. Um, like that's a hard pass for me on the, uh, <laughs> and he travels a lot more than I do. I don't know how he does it. Yeah. You mentioned something about having hundreds of thousands of fans mm. on your site. Are there yeah. people who have reached out to you that you would have never really expected? Um, when you say fans, I mean, like we count them as followers, right? The, 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 are you in touch with people? Are they getting in touch with you on a- It's one of the greatest basis? differences, Lauren, between what I do as a speaker and what I do in tequila. As a speaker, I have an audience. In tequila, I have fans. And it is definitely a community that I'm cultivating purposefully. Uh, I give away a ton of value on the utility side, a lot of free stuff. Um, and, and one of the things that's really powered it, but again, it's creating a little bit of a scalability problem, is that is that I answer every DM. And I'll bet you I get 50 to 60 a night from people who are like, I'm at a bar in Alabama. Here's a picture. Which one should I drink? Like, I get that kind of question all night. I think so I've, literally, I've, literally yeah. every night I just sit there with my phone open while I'm like hanging with my wife or watching TV. And I'm just like answering questions, answering questions, answering questions, answering questions. Um, and, and yeah, I get messages constantly for people saying, wow, or they, or they send me pictures of what they bought. I went to the store and I bought these four bottles because you recommended them. Or I can't believe like what I didn't know about tequila. You've totally changed my life. Like messages like that, all not, not once in a while, all the time. And then it's also really funny because there's a lot of like people who are celebrities or quasi celebrities who, who are trying to get into tequila too. So like I interact with Sammy Hagar a fair bit because he owns a tequila brand uh, mm -hmm. and the rock and Justin Upton, the baseball player and um, Sheila E the drummer and former Prince associate. Like there's a lot of people out there who I now have like an Instagram DM relationship with uh, because I'm the tequila guy, which I find hilarious because I'm like, look, for 30 years, I was the marketing and customer experience guy, and you didn't care about me at all then. But now that I tell you what tequila to buy, Sheila E., you're all in. So I think it's hilarious. I uh, I can't wait for you to assemble like a new mastermind, like a tequila mastermind. A tequila mastermind with a and rock. And you can facilitate yeah. that. And I yeah. think, you know, you just take a picture of that and you'll you'll win the internet. Yeah, and it's exciting. It, you know, we're just getting started. We're, we're only in the first or second inning of this, probably the second inning, I would say, of the tequila thing. And uh, I'm not totally sure where I want it to go. I've got a lot of big ideas, of course, but it's also one of those things like, you know, 
when your hobby becomes, one of the reasons it works is that people know I have a passion for it and it comes through on camera. But when your hobby becomes a job, do you still have the same passion for it? And then does that kind of undercut the whole thing? So that's the question I'm kind of struggling with right now. And we'll see. Yeah. Well, good luck to you. And I know that I am guilty of, you know, texting you. Or oh, anytime. I love it. I love it. Tequila J Bear on Instagram. Tequila J Bear. And you actually have talk about your top 10 lists or those things, because I have bookmarked <laughs> them on my phone yeah. so that I don't blow up your, your inbox every time I go looking for tequila. Um, but what have you compiled that people can find? Yeah, I'm actually keynoting the Creator Economy Expo about this case study um, coming up this spring. This idea that, yes, I got known in the tequila world from Instagram and TikTok. But if the only relationship you have with your fans is Instagram and TikTok, you are beholden to that algorithm uh, and you better hope for the best. And I know enough about digital marketing to, to know that that's probably a bad idea. So what I often do is give away as much value as possible, but then try to de-anonymize the followers by giving them resources that I require their email address to, to download. So the most popular one I have is my top now 23 tequila brands that I recommend kind of across the board. If you see that brand, buy it, you won't be disappointed. Uh, and, and so I've got, you know, I don't know what the email list is now, 30,000 emails. Um, and when I send out an email with an update to the list, the open rate is like 86%. You know, I mean, it's like, it's like out of control, you know, click through rates, like, you know, 42%, like it's numbers that are just astonishing. Uh, and, and so, yes, I've got way more Instagram followers than 30,000, but the 30,000 emails are much more valuable ultimately, right? Because 100%. now, now you can tell them something else or say, Hey, I'm in a, you know, this is, uh, I'm starting my own, um, I'm going to have a single barrel uh, project available this spring and be Jay bear single barrel and, and probably start doing trips. Like who wants to come to Mexico with me? Like once you can communicate to people proactively, then there's a lot of things you can do. But if you don't have the ability to reach them proactively, then you're just hoping that the algorithm shows in the post. Wow. Yeah, no. And I'm a hundred percent down that road with you. Um, I am a subscriber to your list, but I think it's just really impactful to say like, you know, that is a piece of, to de-anonymize that audience and turn them into fans that you can literally convert even with micro conversions is, is so powerful. And it's, it's again, one of those missing pieces that most creators, most brands miss. They're used to renting land. It's actually one of the hardest things I think about podcasting. It's, it's difficult to de-anonymize your audience because people oftentimes are consuming uh, podcasts while multitasking, right? They're they're on a treadmill, they're in a car, they're using a snowblower, they're kayaking, whatever. And so it's sometimes tricky to like stop, click the link, go to the website, download the thing, whatever. Uh, and so and so sometimes it's you got to come up with different ways to de-anonymize that are are less friction filled for for the listeners, right? Whether it's mm -hmm. uh, texting is a possible one. There's lots of different ways to do it, but it's one of the things that I found challenging. You know, being on a podcast for a decade was right. to de-anonymize that audience. Yeah. Well, that is definitely something that I will be looking to do. This is the very beginnings of the brand to fan show. And uh, hopefully I am lucky enough to have a decade of exploring this with you. No doubt. Uh, yeah. But thank you so much uh, for joining in the spirit of your past podcast, Social Pros. Yes. You used to ask every audience or every interview uh, two questions. I didn't completely just lift your questions, but in that okay. spirit... I have two questions for you, Jay Bear, as we wrap up this episode of the Brand to Fan Show. The first one, simply, what are you a fan of today? Uh, I'm certainly a fan of many tequila brands, but I won't uh, I, I won't mention any here because I don't want to get uh, get in trouble. Uh, I'm I'm obviously a, a college sports fan. I live in a college town, so I'm a fan of three, I will say three different universities for different reasons. Uh, the uh, University of Arizona, where I matriculated, uh, University of Nebraska, I'm from Lincoln and my parents went there, uh, and Indiana University, where I live. Uh, all three schools have uh, manifestly terrible football teams. So I've got, uh, I've got, you know, I got fan gear from all of them, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, yeah, I do my best. I'll say those three. Okay. Well, and then I was going to ask you, and you've already uh, here on the video shown that you you are not just representing Arizona Wildcats on your on your shirt, no. but you've got the no. IU, you've got the Nebraska yeah. hat. Yeah. What's your favorite piece of fan apparel? Like maybe you had it in college. Oh, like favorite okay. Favorite ever. Favorite fan apparel. So actually, probably, and I wore it recently uh, in Vegas with our mutual friend Mike Korak. Um, I have a University of Arizona uh, basketball warm up jacket 
that was issued the year that the team uh, won the national championship. So it's it's definitely vintage and super cool and it's team official. So it's really high quality uh, and still fits, which is something. Um, and so, you know, you can't just like wear, you know, a warm up shooting jacket, you know, to anywhere, right? It's a little bit weird, but- <laughs> Vegas but it, is a great place to wear. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so that that's one that uh, that's pretty rare uh, and uh, and I really like it. Well, we probably won't be seeing that one from your closet on fan wagon, but I will be sure to note on your profile when you build it that uh, that anything Arizona, IU, Nebraska. Arizona, IU, Nebraska, you got me covered. Yes, and tequila. Yeah, absolutely. Jay, how can listeners follow you and your work both on the tequila side and uh, the research marketing side? Yep. Uh, lots of places. Jaybear.com is my main website. The new research we talked about is the time to win.com. Uh, and you can find me on Instagram for the tequila stuff, tequila J bear. Awesome. All right. Well, this is the brand of fan show. We are the podcast that unpacks the phenomenon of fandom to help you build for the future by creating more fans. And Jay, you know, I am a huge fan of yours. Um, I'm grateful for everything that you've done for me and, uh, and for being the first guest on the brand of fan show. It's, uh, it's been awesome. We're going to put all those links that Jay mentioned, um, including some of the research in the show notes for this and every episode on brand to And if you like this episode and you want to hear more of that, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I am Lauren Teague, host of the brand to fan show, founder of fan wagon and a uh, massive fan of tequila, J bear, J bear and uh, convincing. Right. So thanks again for joining me. Uh, so glad to have you here. Thanks. Congrats on the show. Excited.